I want to welcome all of you folks uh, uh, with us today uh, for our uh, monthly webinar series. Uh, our presenter today, we're very pleased to have Mike Hutchins with us from the University of Illinois, who will tell you that he's actually in the great city of New Orleans as he speaks. Uh, his topic is going to be corn silage, getting it right. It's going to be brought to you today by Biotol uh, uh, and Forage Inoculants, uh, which is a product from the Lalaman Animal Nutrition uh, uh, Firm. And uh, we welcome you again uh, uh, to, uh, to all of you, those that have been with us before, and those of you uh, uh, who are our first timers. Uh, th thanks. And with that, I'll let Mike uh, get going. Well, very good, Steve. Uh, Mike Hutchins from, uh, from uh, the great area of Louisiana, anyway, and, and we're ready to rock and roll. Jim, should we? I think my first PowerPoint says today's program. Are we on key? Are we all set? Yes, we're going great. Okay, very good. Well, here's what we want to do in the next 35 to 40 minutes. And as always, we welcome your questions. We will take them at the end, as we normally do, and keep right on schedule as far as that goes. Obviously, uh, Steve and I were talking a bit earlier where the price of this corn is going to be. Notice I had $7 a bushel. And when these PowerPoints were put together, that number has gone down a bit. Of course, we talked a little bit about the ethanol subsidy. That is status. That is uh, in Congress right now. It looks like that will be adjusted at this point. Uh, last night, uh, the wringing of the hands, uh, the Beef numbers are below World War II numbers, so they just think cattle numbers are down. Obviously, that is another resource that would utilize corn in finishing yards at this point. So certainly, that comes into play, the economics of corn silage, then looking at pricing, harvest considerations. And though we just add at the end just a quick blurb on snaplage, uh, we, we don't have that as targeted as one of our topics in the next month or two, but obviously, people are talking about that. And so that's kind of the marching orders for today's webinar as we go through it. Again, uh, my personal thanks to uh, Lalaman and the Biotol people for their support and of course Steve Larson, the Hordes Group, for sponsoring the, this series of programs. So let's get started and take a look at corn silage economics. Uh, th this is a very hot topic right now and that is what is corn silage going to be worth? Well, the first thing we did, and I will recognize some people from time to time, Bill Mahana has provided some information today, uh, Dave Fisher, Mark Tegler, just to mention a few names at this point. Uh, this is Sesame, and Mark Tegler ran Sesame. This is the Ohio State uh, summary, and this was using Central Illinois prices. So be clear, some of you that are in different countries, different parts of the U.S., this is Central Illinois. That's where Mark and I live. And so here are the actual prices put in. So you can see corn about 7.30 a bushel. That was the price farmers were paying assuming you were buying the corn and then you can see the corn the various other feeds in so when the word actual indicates what the real price in central Illinois was yeah alfalfa hay at 270 one of our very large farmers locked all his hay in for 240 a ton so we all know alfalfa hay is really going to be high with the drought now we see in Texas and Oklahoma on top of that uh, the pressure on this corn land and then the next column is predicted so uh, that's an, one way to look at it it says corn silage uh, we had it plugged in at 55 we'll show you how we got that number here in a minute it says it's worth when these other feeds are priced as listed $88 a ton. So for some of our livestock producers and dairy producers, they're going to go nuts. They said, Hutchins, I'm not going to pay $88 a ton. Well, the point is that's the relative value when hay and cotton seed and distillers and soy hulls are listed where they're at. Look at where the corn grain price is, guys, and that'll make some of you nervous. It says corn is worth $11 a bushel. So there's always the argument, who's going to blink first? Uh, Kellogg's making cornflakes, ADM making ethanol, or some pig producer in central Illinois. The dairy producer theoretically pay $11 before it becomes too expensive. You can gander on down. There's two yellow figures there. Those are not good buys according to all, uh, the Sesame program there. Fuzzy cotton seed is overpriced slightly and soy hulls are overpriced as well. So that's one way, Steve, and, and, and team to take a look at what is the value of basically corn silage. Another thumb rule you many of us have heard about is 10 times the price of a bushel of corn. And so if corn, and I'll keep big, easy numbers for us today, but you can plug these in if you're in California or Florida or New York, $7 a bushel times 10 would be about $70 a ton. That would be the value. If corn is down, and Steve and I were talking about earlier, if it's down at say 620, then it's $62 a ton. 
Dave Fisher provided this last line and said, well, what does it cost to raise corn silage in Illinois, including land rental, seed, fertilizer, that kind of stuff, somewhere is around $35 to $40 a ton. So you see you're getting lots of different prices if you're growing it, if you're selling it, if you're running through Sesame, or a third way or fourth way that I like, and that is look, building the budget. And I like this one. Here we go. Basically, the ratio is six to eight times the price of a bushel of corn. Where does that come from? Well, the eight number comes from DeKalb, Illinois. Jim Morrison's group tracked this for three years. This is black soil. We don't have dirt in northern Illinois. We have soil, folks. And this is some of the best land you'll find in the, probably in the world. It says the relationship is eight. Uh, for, for you take the a bushel of corn will give you about uh, eight times that will give you what a ton of sides would be worth. If you're in southern Illinois, Dave Fisher uses the number around seven because that soil is not as good. Some of you in northern Wisconsin might use six because you have shorter varieties in different soil and climatic conditions. Anyway, you've got to pick that number. So we're going to use eight because I'm in central Illinois. So I, I take eight times the price of a bushel of corn. So let's go down to our example. So that means if I've got seven dollars a bushel times seven uh, times seven, my constant, we use seven, that's forty-nine dollars. That's for the corn. It's standing out there now. Now I'm going to harvest that. So I'm going to add four Four to eight dollars a ton in the central Illinois. That number tends to be lower because our fields are huge. You get these big John Deere's and Clauses out there; they can really uh, uh, collect corn sides. So I'm going to add in another value of six, as you see in my example. Then I'm going to inoculate. You're going to see I'm pretty bullish on inoculant, and that cost could vary from one to three dollars a ton, depending on whose product you're using and, and products like that. And so you see, I'm going to add two dollars a ton. And so if you look in my example, I've got fifty-seven dollars invested when I look at the land, the cost of, of raising that crop, harvesting and inoculating that, and then I'm going to say, if I'm going to sell it to you, Steve, up at Hortz Dairyman Farm, I, I have to assume the shrink. And I'm going to assume I lose 5%. More about that in just a few minutes. A 5% shrink, so that's another th roughly $3. And so I back into a price of around $60 a ton. So now you've seen prices of 45, you've seen prices of uh, 70, you've seen prices of 60, you see prices of 88. And I think as people online, the question you have to philosophically decide how are you going to price this corn silage as far as that goes. We argue you lock that price in when you chop it. And that's another argument at a point we can do in the Q&A. So if you harvest corn and it's $6.25 today, Steve, and you're harvesting today, that's the price you lock in. December, if the price of corn goes down, then basically we would keep that other price we have listed there as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, that takes care of economics. I think it's a huge point. What's the bottom line, folks? Corn silage is an awfully good buy. If you look at sesame, if you look at these other things, it's an awfully good buy. And for those of us who raise corn silage, it's amazing. It's a really, really one to take a look at. And that's why we and I recommend two-thirds to three-quarters of the forage dry matter coming from corn silage because my computer says it's the cheapest way to feed cows in Illinois. Well, uh, Jim Baltz put this nice visual together. What's next? Uh, when to harvest? And now, wake up, folks. Now, here are some exciting things to think about. There's a real big take-home message coming here. But as always, we will have a poll. And so we're going to find out what you are thinking. So we have a poll question that says you can vote. When do you want to harvest corn silage? So, Jim, I've got to take and uh, click open on my polls, I believe. And I'm going to uh, go down to my poll over here. And, um, okay, that's not working well. Here, uh, I'll, got, I'll launch it. Okay, Jim's going to launch launch it. I'm just going to sit back here. He's launching a poll. So now those of you online, and there's look at almost 50 of you now online, you're going to vote in terms of where you want to go with this poll. And we're going to only give you a few seconds because obviously uh, we just heard President Obama talking about the budget deficit, so we can't be messing around here with you Republicans and Democrats here very long. 50% of you voted. Vote early, vote fast. We're going to give you about another 10 seconds, then Jim is going to launch that and show you where we're at. At this point, we're sitting a very strong 31 to 34%. <clears throat> at this, For some of you who are wondering if I want to bias the, the vote at this stage of the game, uh, coming in on a close second, and we're almost done voting now is you'll see milk line and then 35 to 38. So once we get to 80 percent and we've had the poll open now, Jim, let's go ahead and share that poll if you would please. And so he's going to share the poll with you. We've closed it. He's sharing it. And uh, right now I'm not seeing that, Jim, but are they seeing it? Yes, they are. 
Okay, well, I'm, not, I'm just going to stay where I'm at at this stage of the game. You'll notice the popular choice was 33 to 30, 31 to 34 percent. 44 percent of you went. Uh, 25 went uh, a bit drier. Uh, some of you, a very, only 8 percent went wetter. And about a quarter of you said two-thirds milk line. Well, let's move on. Jim, I'm going to, uh, can I move forward then? Uh, yes, just go ahead. Have I bumped the microphone? That'll wake everybody up. And uh, here we go. And uh, let's look at some bench lines. Here's some pioneer data summarized by F. Thomas. Many of you will recognize that name from the Miner Institute and writes a column in Hordes Dairyman. You might get an idea, well, where am I going to be on these maturities? So you can kind of decide where you're at. We were silking about last week in Illinois. Right on the 4th of July, we were silking. So it says sometime in mid-August, we better be ready if you're looking at milk line. So this is a nice little chart that gives you a little idea where you're at and where you're going to be at this stage. And I'm thinking we're sitting somewhere right about in this area right now here in central Illinois. Northern Illinois, they're ahead of us because they were drier. Southern Illinois, man, we're sitting, we're, we're, we're really in tough shape yet at this stage of the game. It's really going to be a later crop as far as that goes. Wake up. Wake up. Powerful, powerful set of data from Wisconsin. And it simply looks, and read this carefully, uh, this is a number of different whole plant moistures, as you can see on the, on the column, uh, on, on the, the vertical column. And then you go from basic, now black layer means the, co the corn has physiologically matured. It will not store any more nutrients in the kernel itself. So you can see 100%, then we're coming, that would be, uh, depending on how you want it, it says 75%, it's going to be in, 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 uh, in, uh, in milk stage, 50% milk stage as we go from left to right at this point. So you can see, um, a trim, look at the variation. Look at the variation. You have a huge variation. And we know moisture is critical in terms of getting a good fermentation and good compaction and good palatability. So remember this slide. By the way, if you look at 1 o'clock up there, you'll notice that little pointer up there. There, there you can see the, uh, the cob. It's broken half. And that would be two, that would be two-thirds of what I call two-thirds of three-quarters milk line. In other words, that starts at the tip of the kernel. As you work towards the cob, you see that little white line. That's your milk line. If you take your fingernail, or you take a jackknife and you prick on that, you, you'll find there's liquid there. And so that would, that for many of us, we'd say, ah, get the chopper out, and let, let's rock and roll as far as that goes. Now, here comes another important point. Remember this one. As grain yield goes up, size yield goes up. So question, there's no question you and I want to get as much grain yield as we can because I'm going to get more tonnage per acre. And of course, with current prices of corn, we really, really want that starch as well. So that's a powerful relationship. And then I go to the next PowerPoint. And while this is very busy, this is what happens. And boy, folks, look at this one. As you can see, going from 28 to 34 to 40 percent dry matter, you can see the plant is changing. Now, lignin and protein doesn't do much. But look at a couple of these other big ones here. In fact, Jim Baltz did a nice job. And he said, OK, Mike, let's look at the big three. And here they are. And so you can see as we go from 28, which is fairly immature, wet corn silage, typically about 20% starch. Look, look what happens. You can see when we get up here by the black layer thing, we increase starch content by almost 76%. And so we're simply saying that's important. So some of us who voted real wet, remember, you're going to give up a lot of starch. You're going to give up a lot of starch. And of course, as starch goes up, NDF goes down, ADF goes down. So you nutritionists, you've got to be really sure that you've got that under control when you start building rations at this point. So you can see that's a very important concept as far as that goes. So the point, take home point on that one is we got to make sure we have enough moisture to get good compaction and fermentation. But the later we can wait to maximize starch yield, the better off we're going to be. So on the poll question, 44, I would argue that only 25% got it right. And this could be a big argumentative point. We're simply saying if you're chopping at 31 to 34% dry matter, you still have plant potential in the field. We could still capture more starts at this stage of the game. So that's a Hutchins bias. Now, uh, where you sit, that's going to be your call. But the point is, a little bit later cut probably is where we want to be going. Okay. Next uh, controversy, point of contention, where are we going to cut it? Height of cut. Uh, this is some data pulled together by the Penn State group looking at 11 different height chop studies. I know there's some Wisconsin data in here. I think there's some Minnesota data in here. And now here's where you can be your politician as far as that goes. Uh, we're chopping here at about six inches. You know, For those of us in, in Canada and other countries, here's your centimeters. You're more comfortable in centimeters. And high chop would be like 20 inches. Many times farmers will say, gee, we got such a huge crop. We're just going to let more of that stock out there. And the answer is yes, that's an alternative. 
alternative. Look what happens here, folks. You can see the dry matter changes slightly at this point. Protein never changes very hardly at all. But look, here's your fibers. Here's it's your ADF and your NDF. So you leave about uh, seven to eight to nine percent of the fiber in the field, and that's your lower digestible fiber. So that's one consideration. Yes, you can get a hotter, a richer, a better corn starch. Here's your starch. Notice we increase starch by about six percent on these eleven different studies. None of these numbers to write home with. We we like to see our starches in the mid 30s here in Illinois, and of course that translates into energy as far as that goes and NDF digestibility. So you can see we come across, but then you also notice while you've increased the starch six percent and you drop the fiber, I've also dropped the yield by seven percent. So in my view, a Hutchins bias view, you have to make your decision: Do you want the tonnage, or do you want a little higher quality crop? My recommendation to my dairyman I work with, I'm taking the tonnage. I'll let my nutritionist, my consultant, whoever's putting my rash together, let he or she deal with the fiber because I may want and need that fiber as a source in the ruminant diet. So to me, I would not chop high unless we had to do something maybe with uh, uh, nitrates if we got, got ourselves in a situation because we know the bottom the bottom uh, portion of the, the, the stock is really, really high, high nitrates. But otherwise, I would not go to a, uh, to a, to a high chop. But you, you got the numbers. You've got the same numbers I have. My conclusion is I'm going to chop low. Your conclusion could be high. And you can, you can take these numbers. You know the old adage, Steve, figures never lie, but liars always figure. And I think this table kind of fits that one pretty nicely. Mike, bottom line uh, is... I just want to mention on this uh, that uh, in our August 10 issue, uh, the field to feed bunk uh, topic from uh, Ev Thomas and uh, uh, help me, uh, Phil Mahana. Phil Mahana, thank you. Uh, will be on this very subject. So if some pe people want to digest what you're saying here and then dig into it a little bit, they're using, uh, uh, you know, they're looking at milk per acre and uh, tons per acre and looking at some comparisons that way. So that's going to be another look at that same topic coming up in our August 10 issue. Go ahead. Yeah, Stephen. In fact, I think I, I'm glad you you mentioned that. I, I think if my memory is right, the milk per acre ends up being very parallel. In other words, you you give up some yield, but you also are, or gain some yield, but you give up some quality. But uh, milk per ton obviously is going to win every every time because right. you've less you've left some of the fiber in the field. So it's, it makes for a great discussion at this stage of the game of where where you're going to go. But I I love to have that forage inventory, especially with hay prices going to be as high as they are. I'm pretty 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 Dutch on this one here. I'm gonna I'm gonna take all all the tonnage I can get and give me some flexibility depending on cow numbers and prices and those kind of factors that come into play. Good comment, Steve. Well, let's go to the next one, another decision point, and that would be a silage inoculant. Uh, at this point, you can see this happens to be a, a Gandhi applicator going on into a bag. So we got lots of different ways to apply inoculants. We can argue that a bit later. We like the liquids. There's no question liquids are a way to go, but if your chopper is not set up to do that or your custom operator cannot do it, then there's other alternatives to get the job done as well. Now, this is a very busy slide, and I'm not going to walk you through it. I think one of the reasons for the webinars is you can go back to our archives, and Steve will comment on that at the end of the program. You can go back. But this is kind of our guideline to say, well, what is the function of a silage inoculant? There they are listed. It does some really neat things, and I'll let you read those. Then the question is, how many? And I think that's powerful. You'll see this is the recommendation, 100,000 colony forming units, or CFUs, per gram of wet silage. That really sounds like, you know, like a boatload of stuff, but these little buggers are pretty small. And then this comes from the USDA Forage Research Center for several years ago, going, what are the good guys? Which, which ones are wearing white hats? And here they are. They're listed there for you to take a look at. So look at your counts to make sure they're viable. Make sure you have the guys in the white hats there. But cost will vary, especially some of the newer products that are coming online. They have other things than just the, 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 the bacteria uh, inoculate with them. They may have enzymes or they may have other uh, things added to it. So the price, there's some really big swings on, on prices on inoculant out there. Our benefit to cost ratio is six to one. We'll show you how we got that number in just a minute. And you can see we're recommending them uh, basically to any what what feed at this stage of the game. Uh, corn silage is today's subject, haylage, high moisture corn, baleage, if you can get them on it would be ideal, that's always a little bit of a challenge, but certainly we recommend them as far as that goes at this stage of the game. So this is your primer, this gives you some guidelines, some numbers to look at on the tag. 
be sure you do that as far as that goes. If it works well, then you're going to have a feed that looks like this central column. This is uh, from Lehman Kong and Randy Shaver. This is recommended fermentation profiles, and a good research-based inoculant will drive this middle column. So you're telling me if you've got good corn silage being produced in August, September, October this year, after it goes through an entire fermentation cycle, I should see the pH value around 3.6 to 3.8, lactic acids over 5%. I expect to see very low ethanol there at this stage of the game. The uh, uh, lactic acid acetic ratio should be about 3 to 1 unless you're using the Buchanan product. If you're using the Buchanan product, and several companies now have those available, basically you are going to see a little more acetic acid there. And of course, the beauty of that product is that's a back end inoculant, which means stability at feed out time. And so uh, again, you have to ask yourself if that's going to be important in your in your bunk, in your bag, your silo, wherever you're coming from, that you don't want to have the secondary fermentation and yeast formation from occurring. Acetic acid will really champion that. So again, if you're using one of those little other inoculants, that number might change a little bit and not be quite 70% on the lactic acid. But to me, we recommend our dairymen check this out at least once a year to see how good a job did you actually do in the fermentation process process. You can't do much with nutrient profiling. That's a, you've got other tests to do that and we'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. But that's to me an awfully nice report card to say, yep, I got an A this year my corn side because it matches up pretty nicely with these numbers we have here in front of you. To go back and look at corn side specifically, Joe Harrison at Washington State and several years ago went through the Journal of Dairy Science and looked at all the research that was journal published, peer reviewed. Pretty powerful data. Now we have no idea whose products they are. Did they put the right level on? All, all we're simply saying is this is a journal published research. And you can see the inoculants had some real impact on dry matter recovery. That is statistically significant. It says you recover three and a half percent more dry matter. Folks, that's three and a half acres out of a hundred acres that you end up getting added feed value. So that's a huge number because we direct the fermentation, we control and get an optimal fermentation from occurring. And then the next line down says dry matter digestibility. That is also statistically significant. It says because we don't burn up as much of the soluble carbohydrates such as some of the sugars and starches and solubles, we actually have better digestibility. Uh, for us guys that grew up in Wisconsin, we call that TDM. Uh, you guys may call them megajoules if you're in Europe or something like that. It simply says I have first I have more dry matter and then I have more digestibility with that. Those two numbers will give you a six to one, roughly a six to one ratio, especially with today's feed prices. So it says inoculant, if I spend a dollar on inoculant, I will get about six dollars back in terms of dry matter recovery and uh, nutrient savings and digestibility. Notice there is a nice increase on milk production. That was not statistically significant, but it is obviously uh, it simply says uh, not only do we have more dry matter and more nutrients, but my cows understood it as well. It gave me more milk. If you take that, uh, that, that inoculated corn size, put it through a high producing dairy cow, then your benefit to cost ratio can reach almost 9 to 1 to 10 to 1 because dairy cows add value to a feedstuff as far as that goes. And that is some of Keith Bolson data that he's done before he retired at Kansas State a few years ago. So awfully powerful information here to say is that uh, to me, uh, it's a no-brainer. I think you want to get a research inoculant that, uh, or inoculant that's got some research behind it to be tar targeted the crop you want to use on your dairy farm. I think it has to be there. And I know Steve Horns does a survey, and I, I think somewhere's around 70% of your people that uh, are using inoculants. I'm not sure. Put you in a tough spot. I'm not sure if that number is exactly right. Do you recall, Steve? I don't have that number in front of me, but it's a very high per percentage, Mike. That's right. So anyway, uh, away we go from there. So what's the bottom line on this phase of corn size of strategies for 2011? I think you've got to inoculate. I don't think. You've got to inoculate. So if I was your consultant, you trust me, you would be inoculating as far as that goes out here on, on your dairy farm. Well, let's switch gears to another important question coming up, and that is processing corn silage. And so we're going to go ahead and look at processing. Now, for some of you who haven't seen a processor, this is a mock-up. And if you look at that, basically, th this is my feed rollers coming. So my corn silage is coming in very, very, very perpendicular to my knives. So these rollers directed in here. And here's my theoretical length of chop. So depending on how fast these feed rolls are feeding in, how fast this thing is turning, that is your half inch, your three-quarter inch, your one inch theoretical of chop. That is your length of chop. 
So that's one setting you have. Remember that here in just a few minutes. Then once we chop, it goes to what we call the cracker module. In other words, these rollers, and there's a clearance anywhere from one to five to six millimeters, these turn, and they turn at different speeds and at sometimes different directions. So we just tear, literally tear apart feed particles that are coming through here. And of course, this blows it into the wagon, into the truck, wherever it's going to go. So that is a very simply a very simple mock-up that to me makes it pretty easy to say, you and I have two decisions to make. What is this clearance? What is this theoretical length of chop known as TLC? And then what clearance are we going to have back here on my and on, on my on my processor? And so let's find out what you're thinking. Jim, do you want to go ahead and launch this for us, please? Okay, it's launched. Jim's going He's, he's launching this. Here's your chance to vote again. Since three quarters you got the last one wrong, let's get this one right here. By there is there is a consistent there is a right answer here, and our uh, our polling has started at this case. Uh, we got 11 percent of you in, and uh, uh, kernel processing score got a very high one, but it's losing ground. Must be the Republicans coming in now because uh, we're getting a little more drift as far as that goes. You have four choices. Uh, we're in 25 seconds. Improve kernel processing score. That's really the the breaking of the kernel. We're going to show you that score from Wisconsin, Dave, done by Dave Mertens. In fact, he's down here at the conference. We visited with him. Effective fiber says getting it long enough, a consistent cut, uh, precision chopping, if you wish. And some of us say, I just want to make sure that I've got a pretty good density as far as that goes. Uh, Mike, pretty slow voting here, Jim. Uh, at this while, point. The, uh, while the results are coming in, uh, my support crew here, bless them, uh, said 82% of our readers uh, use uh, inoculant for corn silage and 75% wow. use it for hay silage. Fantastic. Well, that's really good to know. That's a nice survey of readers from Hordes Dairyman. They do that every year. Steve, thanks so much for sharing that, and our thanks to your staff. Jim, let's cut this off, and let's show everybody, since uh, we're a little slower on the voting here, we and we have more people, maybe they're just not voters anymore. We're up to almost 60. Welcome aboard. And we've got 60, about two-thirds, say, improved kernel processing score. Another 25% maintain effective fiber. 7% say, I want to use precision cut. And another 5% said, I really want to make sure I could good density. Really fascinating. I'm going to see if I can change your minds here in just a few minutes. So Jim, I'm going to go back to mine and uh, we're going to move forward. Let's look at the research. Isn't that always fun to do? Again, uh, this was pulled together, kind of a meta-analysis, and they looked at 22 published uh, studies in various journals, both European, Canadian, and U.S., and here's the bottom line. More milk, about one, but look at this. Do you see this? Look at this range you have here, folks. Anywhere from a minus one pound to a four pound. So, you know, some cows can really figure it out because you can look at dry matter intake. In some cases, cows ate less of processed corn silage. They must be democratic cows. They understand the science. Or you can see some nice intake. So I'm pretty sure these numbers track pretty nicely together. Notice butterfat test was higher, and that's because they probably can't separate the cob out and because of particle size. Notice two percent fat crack that we got actually a nice increase in butter fat test so actually we got uh, on average about two pounds more milk so if your kernel processor is going to charge you for chopping uh, processing and you can get two pounds more milk in a, uh, in a cow getting 60 wet pounds of corn silage boy you know that's 60 70 pounds more milk that's per ton uh, with today's milk price boy you can don't tell your kernel processor uh, guys that, but you can afford to pay quite a bit for that technology. You can also see a better packing density, similar uh, stability, aerobic, and a slight increase in digestibility in situ, meaning that obviously these cows can digest this feed, which makes sense. We're going to tear the plant part, the stalk part of it, cob's going to be broken down, the kernel's going to be more exposed in the ruin. Pretty powerful data, folks, that says we got to be there. We've got to be there. Now, this guideline comes from Illinois, and we're saying this is how I would rank yours. So if you had your Penn State box and you shook out the corn silage, I'd ex I, to get an A-plus today, I want to be in that 10 12% in the top box, over 50% in the middle box, and less than 35 in the bottom two boxes, or if you have a three-box unit, you'd have those two numbers together. We use this as effective fiber. So it said if these were your numbers, you'd be about 65% of the fiber would be a particle size, I should should say 65% of the particle size would be effectiveness in length as far as that goes at this point. And that's powerful. Our really guys that are really getting it right are getting close to 70%, which means it has 70 plus percent the value of baled hay. 
which means we really got it right. Notice that's three quarter of an inch theoretical length of chop, which is 19 millimeters at this stage gate. Remember that number here in a minute. So that's our guideline. We like to do this also when it's coming in from the field because it never gets longer in storage. And so in other words, if you don't get it right coming out of the field, it's not going to get any better coming out of your silo or out of your bag. We then go to, actually there's a way to measure this. This comes uh, developed by the University of Wisconsin. It's called the Corn Size Processing Score, abbreviated CSPS. At this stage you can send a sample into these forage testing labs and they will take and calculate the percent starch that's going through a 4.7 millimeter screen. For us uh, country boys, that's about a quarter inch screen opening as far as that goes uh, out there. And ideally you'd like to have 70% going through there. Personally, I'd like to see it 90 plus percent, but this is the Wisconsin ranking. I don't want to see it twice, especially as the corn starts drying down, depending on what our growing conditions are going to be like. So I would we'd like to have over 70% going through that screen, and you can see then it becomes average, uh, about half of it, two-thirds of it going through, and then of course we get some down here. And we saw some data a couple years ago, which really made us unhappy. We were only getting about 25% in the optimal range. So what's the bottom line on this slide says, guys and gals, we've got to get it right. We just have to get it right at this point. Uh, Bill Mahanner provided this uh, this to me at this point, the kernel processing. This is a great job. Notice, very nicely done. Look at over here, the poor job. You notice we've got these hockey pucks, as we call them. So obviously, these are not getting uh, broken up through the processor. And look at all the whole kernels I have here. Now, the question is, will I see that coming through in the feces? That's a $64 question. If this is 29, 30% uh, 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 dry matter corn size, a pretty good chance I won't see this. But if it's 35, 36, uh, I tell you, you better get some pigs behind your cows because you're going to have lots of corn coming through on these cows and now you get to feed it or buy it twice. Not a very good deal as far as that goes. So again, looking at this, and again, there are some techniques out there in the field where you can actually take a cup of this corn silage and actually count the number of kernels that you have here. We don't want to see any of them. I don't want to see, to be honest with you, I do not want to see any corn kernels in the grain at all. It's still there when you test it for starch content. Now, wake up. Big, big slide. Talking to one of our, our major pr processors at a conference call last week, he said, Mike, you can't have it all. He says, you, you, can't, you can't have everything. So if some of you who voted for higher effective fiber, if you want more effective fiber, that means longer. And I've seen farmers chopping at one inch or 15, 16 inch of theoretically chop, you will get a lower processing score, meaning more kernels going through, and it'll be less consistent, and it may not pack as densely, especially on the drier side. Now, some of you voted for higher processing score, higher processing score. If you do that, it means you're going to have less effective fiber because you really got that, you really got that cracker really hammering that kernel, of that kernel at this stage of the game. But the good news, you will get more bulk density because you really tore that crop apart. Now, some of you, and I look at my poll here, about 7% want a consistent cut, then you end up saying, well, you're going to have less effective fiber and maybe a little poor processing score. And right now, this one manufacturing company, they're going to develop a spreadsheet trying to give you an economic index in terms of how much do you give up. In other words, where do you want to be in this mix here? Three-quarter inch, five-eighths, half inch one millimeter, two millimeter, three millimeter, and I think I will challenge you as participants on our webinar is that there's no one right answer, and this one major ma manufacturing company said, Mike, there is no equipment, I don't care if it's coming from Europe or US or Canada, that you can have a perfect, you can have all three of these things at this stage of the game. By the way, going back uh, to our polling question, I would agree with the majority, I want improved kernel processing. That's where I want to go. All four of those characteristics are important, but I think the majority uh, got it right this time. Two-thirds of you said increase, increasing the kernel processing score. So what's the bottom line on this one here? Basically, the bottom line is we've got to process all corn silage in Illinois and Wisconsin and California and New York, and we've got to make sure the processes are setting right to get an optimal product that you want, realizing you maybe can't have it perfect at this stage of the game. Obviously, the variety, the moisture, the stage of maturity, uh, your storage unit, all those will become factors in there. And maybe we'll have a tool in the next two or three months from now that you can actually uh, uh, plug numbers in and say you should be chopping at 5 eighths, 2 millimeter, or whatever the case is going to be for your farm and your condition. 
Okay, let's move on. Our time is getting away from us. We're 35 minutes in. We got about 10, 10 minutes of time to go here. Let's look at covering and bunker and uh, covering and uh, sealing bunkers. Uh, I, again, a, a PowerPoint from Bill Mahana. Thank you, Bill. Basically, a four step process. Number one, we're going to put the cover over the wall. Now we're looking at walls at this stage game. It was piles, obviously. You would not be you, you, you'd be coming off of one side of the pile and bring it over the top. Then you're going to drop it down on the wall. We think that's critical. And then we, in some cases, farmers will put a uh, PCV pipe in here to take any moisture that may come down along the wall. Because you can see, we're going to take this part that's laying over the side. We're going to bring it over the top. So we're going to overlap it. So water could actually rain, snow, precipitation could actually go down inside this wall. And that's what that PCV pipe is going to do. We've had a few farmers try to bring this plastic out a little bit further, but then, of course, the filling gets to be a factor in terms of tire traffic and, and tearing up as far as that goes at this point. And then, of course, we'll move forward. Now, here's another schematic from Dave Fisher that looks very nicely. Another way is to view this is that you've got this plastic here. Initially, it'd be over the wall. Then once you've got it, when well, you're ready to seal it, you come here with your oxygen barrier. That's what that green is. That's an oxygen barrier. More about that in just a minute at this point. We put that oxygen barrier down or it's part of the, the, the actual product itself called the one step or two step. Once you've got this oxygen barrier down, then you bring this over the top and you layer it. And in fact, we've had dairymen said that if even without when they didn't have the oxygen barrier, if you looked at silage here, you could physically see an improvement here versus here over here in terms of the condition of that silage. So the overlapping is really important, and we like this one. This this would be the A plus. This would be the A plus at this stage of the game. So let's take a look at that. Here's your oxygen barrier film that you have right here. It's almost, some people call it saran wrap-like, very, very thin, a little tricky to put down, but you can see this is underneath here, and now you can see this bunker picture here. Here they are putting the saran wrap down. I believe it's halage, unfortunately, but that's okay. And here's your saran wrap, and then here we're coming with the, with the white plastic over the top, and then we're putting the weights on. Yeah, it looks more than a one-person job at this stage of the game, but gives you a bit of a view at this stage of the game. Uh, we, had, uh, we have pulled the trigger on oxygen transmitting the rates here. We think it's the only way to go, to be very honest with you. This is some data from Michigan State University looking at what they call oxygen penetration or oxygen transmitting rate, all abbreviated as OTR. And you can see here uh, on our controls uh, that this is the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, cubic centimeters of oxygen per meter of surface over 24 hours. The number is 1811. I'm not sure exactly. I'm not enough of an engineer to equate what that may all mean. But the point is, with the one stop, you can see we end up, uh, we, we end up getting uh, this cut down huge amount of oxygen penetration and you and I both know oxygen penetration means loss of dry matter and feed quality and so you've got the one stop or one stop or two stop uh, uh, in terms of uh, putting this material on uh, here to me uh, it just shows tremendous dry matter recovery and feed quality out here in the program will it cost more yes it will it will cost more. I heard one figure, Steve, of about 50 to 60 percent more, but I could not find that. I could not get a call back to find exactly what that cost differential was between control versus one stop. And boy, the difference in feed quality and dry matter recovery I, is more than enough to pay pay for that technology. This slide probably should have been pulled a little bit later on, but let's talk it now. Uh, but don't overpack. Uh, the challenge I think you see, you'll see, and that is when you pack, uh, I've got dairymen who say, well, once I get done with my corn size, I'll run another two hours on top of the, the pile or the bunker. And really what you're doing is just squishing the crap out of your corn size in the last 6, 8, 10, or 12 inches. You don't get that much more packing further down. Packing occurs initially, and you'll see that here in just a minute. So again, uh, running uh, hours over the top of your bunker may make you feel better and, and, and sleep better at night, but you actually may be the top of it and you may have more spoilage and where's that top foot you may see more mold and damage because you literally tore that uh, that plant apart and exposed it to uh, other factors as well uh, here's your bottom line here's your a plus again uh, thanks to Bill Mahana sharing this slide here you can see a bunker that gets an A plus you can see we've got it covered here uh, very nicely with with these bags notice what they're doing they're actually taking this back as needed so there's no air penetration here this is one of the things we see a lot of times farmers are pulling back 
8, 10, 12 feet off the surface here. And especially like Steve, when you got your inch of rain last night in Wisconsin, that really causes some problem getting that wet. And notice this drops down the face. So if the rain was coming horizontally, as you said, Steve, uh, from this direction here, that would give some protection to the face of this bunker as well. So this ends up being the, the A+, plus, no question about it. Mm. Extremely well managed in this uh, picture here at this stage of the game. Well, let's go to the packing of, of silage at this point, and you can see uh, some scary things going on uh, on these bunkers at this stage of the game. Uh, another poll question. Jim, let's go ahead and launch this and say, okay, uh, you guys and gals that work out there, uh, what, what, what type of densities would you like to see on corn silage? And we'll give you four choices. Uh, the poll is now open, and uh, we've got some voters coming in here quickly. And uh, 10 to 12 pounds per cubic foot of dry matter, that's cubic feet per dry matter, uh, 12 to 14, 15 to 18, over 20 over 20. Looks like I missed one there, Jim, but that's okay. Good enough for government work. Looks like I missed 19, but we'll let that go at this stage of the game. And we've got about 30 seconds in. It looks like we've got uh, some active voting going. We're running two-thirds at 15 to 18. We've got an, about another third, a quarter sitting in at, uh, at 12 to 14, and we're getting a few more votes now for over 20 pounds per cubic foot. So what is the recommended density? So we got some variation again. That's always fun to see. Maybe we will have some impact for our webinar here to maybe get some more commonality of uh, thought process. We're out. Jim, uh, are you going to share that at this point? We're sharing it. So the bottom line here with 70% of the vote in, uh, 27, nobody wanted to go under 12, hooray, hooray, ding, ding for you, 27% from 12 to 14, now, two thirds of you roughly said 15 to 18 pounds and then another 12% over 20, over 20. Well, let's look at some research, never fails. Here's some uh, data pulled together by Brian Holmes and um, and Richard Muck, he's with the USDA Forage Research Center. And let's just go to the right side. We're looking at uh, 81 uh, corn silage silos at this point. And uh, I'm not quite sure if these are bunker or pile, so we'll have to just call them bunker, uh, excuse me, they are bunker silos. Mike, if you'd read it, you'd see it. You can see the average is 14 and a half. At this point, you can see, look at the range, look at the range, as low as 8 to as high as 23 at this stage of the game. So the point is, huge, huge ranges, and I'm sure, look at the dry matter ranges up there as well at this stage of the game. We go to the next one, and this is some new data I just uh, had given to me here about two weeks ago, and it says some work, again, out of the USDA Forage Research Center by, by uh, Dr. Muck, looking at what are the factors that determine dry matter density. And it's a correlation, so it simply says, the, in other words, the first one is layer thickness. And that was the, the highest correlation. It said the, the thinner it is, the more dense it is. So uh, if you're packing two or four inches, obviously you're a lot better off than packing six or eight or ten inches. So you can see that's the number one. That's the number one. If we really wanted to be nasty, we could have picked some of these out and had you vote on them a bit earlier. The one in yellow is one that kind of jumps out at you, and it says the drier the corn silage, the better it packs. And that is because some of the moisture uh, allows the plant cell to crush easier. So it's a little more crushable product, believe it or not, but that's the one that may not make much sense to you. The rest all much fall into play, but you can see thickness and weight are huge. Thickness and weight are huge at this stage of the game, and then you can start seeing some of the other factors that are that came into the analysis. Pretty neat data. Pretty neat data at this stage of the game to take a look at. This is some older data, uh, data done by Kurt Rempel out of New York State. It's got some age on it, but it's a take-home message, folks. Notice over here, this is your density. So notice if our density is down around 10, 11, or 12, dry matter loss. I mean, 20 percent of the feed is gone. It disappeared. It fermented away. Whatever the case is, uh, had secondary fermentation, mold, uh, uh, gave it away to a Democratic uh, governor in prison in Illinois. Who knows? But notice, as you can see, as we come down these densities here, look, look what happens. And people would say that we need to redo this data with our newer technologies, with our kernel processors and that. Those numbers probably won't be quite as high, but the take-home message is clear, guys and gals, and that is we've got to get these, these, these units packed. And if you've ever seen a bunker at 19 or 20, and I know 12% of you said over 20, aren't they something else? They are really something else to behold. You literally cannot get a hand in there to get a sample to feed. It is packed so very tight out there in the program. 
Another new technology that some uh, feed companies have is using the infrared uh, thermal graphics here. Uh, here's a picture. This would be a treated uh, with an inoculant, a, a commercial inoculant. This side over here, this would be the control over here. So they take a picture of that and look at this guys and gals and you can read the temperature. So you can see up in the green here, here's the blue. That, that's down at 30 degrees centigrade very very stable probably ambient temperature and then we get to the top half of the bunker you can see now it goes up to about 32 very very stable here is a non inoculated slide look at here here we're at 38 degrees she's heating it's heating at this stage of the game if I back up again if things work right Mike back it up notice we have some knockdown feeds over here and you look at see those knockdown feeds over here we go again over here, notice they're picking up temperatures as well uh, at this point, but not quite as bad with the inoculant. So again, neat technology that you might have available on your farms through some feed companies or some silage inoculant companies. You can actually have this, this done for you, but the point is, wow, this, this packing and, and density is really, really important. Well, that's half the story. Get it in tight enough. The next half of the story is how do you remove it? And guidelines would be if you could take off um, six to eight inches a day off the face, the entire face would be ideal. Uh, if you're milking 3,000 cows, that's possible. If you're milking 200 cows, 100 cows, a little bit more of a challenge as far as that goes. We need to move more of it in hot weather for obvious reasons because of the secondary yeast formation. Because once the, uh, the, uh, the corn side is exposed to oxygen, uh, some of the yeasts that are there will start uh, utilizing some of the lactic acid and allows for the secondary fermentation to occur. We want to keep the the, the face very clean, minimize damage. You'll notice over here on the left side that's a facer uh, doing a, a very nice job coming down the face of this unit here. So they knock this down just what they need for the day and they clean this all up. It is gone at this stage of the game. Trust me, in 12, 24 hours after you knock this down, move that to another alternate site. It will be hot, especially temperatures we have now in the Midwest. Here's another way this person doing a very nice job. He, he or she, not sure what it is, who they are, they're shaving it off. So they're coming in sideways on this pile and they're shaving this off here very, very carefully and doing a nice job. Bottom line, A plus is on both of them. They're doing an awfully nice job at this stage of the game. Yes, we all saw the height of this bunker and that makes us a little nervous at this stage of the game. Well, we're going to have to speed, be up a little bit. Uh, I, I think uh, Forge NDF, this is kind of an old topic, uh, so hang on to your hats, folks. We're going to be cruising through this modestly fast at this stage of the game, but the point is another way to evaluate corn silage. And we know that look, this is the adjustability of the cell wall, and of course it's a hot topic in corn silages because there are different kinds of corn silages you can purchase. Some that are considered forage varieties, some are considered dual purpose uh, at this stage of the game and forward to me that's the that's the gold standard NDF digestibility of the forage you can do that at 30 48 hours we now see some 24 hour analyses more about that a bit later first question is that's the gold standard but make sure you have apples to apples and oranges to oranges there is a difference of about five to seven units according to Pat Hoffman depending on what you're using 30 hours typical retention time in the digestive tract of, of, of the feed stuff this simply means if it's not uh, digested 48 hours it's coming all in the manure as far as that goes we know as NDF declines that means we tend to have uh, more lignification, less energy values, and lower dry dry matter intake potential. So it really, it really marks your corn size in terms of a critical factor, and that's rate of passage and energy content. Be very careful that uh, we know you've got to stay within a given lab, so that's your take-home message here. You can look at this at your leisure at this point. Uh, this is just kind of an overview of N forage NDF at this point. Uh, this is um, some of the older data from Michigan State by Oba and Allen. Simply shows that as we get an increase for every one unit change, meaning as NDF digestibility goes, uh, improves by one unit, uh, going say from uh, 46 to 47, I expect a quarter of a pound more dry matter intake, and that translates into about a half a pound of fat corrected milk. That's a feed efficiency of 1.8 folks. So it simply says these cows have that figured out at this stage of the game. Ballpark numbers. Pat Huffman provided this. Go to their website at Wisconsin. Here's your corn silage. I'd like to be over 55 over NDF digestibility of 55. Some of our other uh, newer varieties may approach 70. So certainly there are big range values here, but trust me, we want this number here because this one is really hurting us on first crop this year. At least in Illinois with our wet spring, we have lots and lots of lower quality that are in the 40s. And that means we need to have some of this really good stuff, this good forage to help balance this out, trying to make these, let these 80 pound cows do their thing 
out there on dairy farms. We also know this old story here that as you increase in, uh, in storage, the NDF digestibility and the starch availability both increase. Research out of Wisconsin, a couple of the places, four to six months, but usually they say three to four months. You'd love to have it. And so write this down. What you want to take home message is Christmas corn silage. So in other words, have enough inventory on the farm so that you and I can actually get to Christmas and before we have to open up the new crop as far as that goes because I want to pick up this higher feed value. We as nutritionists also have to be aware that this corn silage in April is going to look different than it did in November and so we really want to make some adjustments in the feeding program to allow for that to occur. Uh, this is some Cumberland Valley analysis uh, from last year's corn crop simply showing the tremendous differences. These are seven hour in vitro starch digestibility. So be careful on this one. This is starch. So Ralph Ward, thank you for sharing this data with us here. You can see this is in vitro starch digestibility in the corn size in seven hours, not NDF, corn silage and take a look you can look at the number of samples you can see some of these seeds the starches can be over 90 percent are going to go in the first seven hours so as dairy managers nutritionists be well aware this stuff can really be smoking as we'd say not bad just be aware of that and make sure that we handle it appropriately well, we're going to wrap up here because our time is gone here's our last powerpoint second last powerpoint feeding corn silage Basically, here are the rules. Uh, if you have questions, I will welcome them. I'm not going to walk you through them. We've covered some of them at this stage of the game. I think buffer is a no-brainer. I think you, if you're going to be feeding uh, uh, two-thirds of your ration as corn silage, you better have a, a ruined model out there. And Chuck Schwab will talk more about that in a couple of weeks and a couple in, our, in one of our webinars here in, in two months at this point, looking at lysine levels at this stage of the game. And much like some of your speakers, you eat too much corn silage, your cows get well round like some of your lectures as far as that goes at this point. What about straw for corn size? We hear this quite a bit. The answer is yes and no. If I need to get some fiber, slow things down, uh, improve manure score, then a pound or two of straw processed properly so they don't sort it can make all these numbers look good. And so the answer is yes, you might need some straw, but if you've got other alternatives, some hay, some haylages, some other products out there, you might be able, you may not need the straw at all. So my answer is yes and no on this one here. And our last PowerPoint has to do with Snaplage, and then I think we'll open up to Q&A at this point. Snaplage is a product that's right hot right now, and basically here's some of the take-home bullets that you can think about. It's increasing in popularity because these big field processors can bring in eight or ten rows at a time. Uh, snaplage, as we define, it can, includes the ear, which includes the cob and the kernel, the husk, and then sometimes par plant parts, depending on the hybrid, the moisture, the humidity, always comes into play. We're calling that snaplage. It will contain somewhere around 25% NDF, so you'll have more NDF. Uh, corn grain will be around 9% NDF, so I'm getting more fiber into the product. And the starch content will vary, again, depending on hybrid and various other sources as far as that goes as well. 50 to 60 percent starch as far as that goes at this stage of the game. Normally you're going to harvest it right at black layer. That's when you're probably going to take it and the moisture is going to be, as you can see down here, somewhere around that 35 to 45 percent dry matter. So it's that window between corn silage and high moisture corn as far as that goes. Why are people excited about it? Well, we have the equipment. We can get 25, uh, 15 to 20, 15 to 25 percent set more dry matter per acre that could be interested at this point it can have 80 to 90 percent the value of energy because it depends on how much trash we use the word trash that would be husk and plant parts but what's the good news guys and gals that trash is pretty good stuff it's pretty digestible but and the cob also is more digestible before it becomes uh, more mature at this stage of the game I would definitely inoculate that with a book knife product. I think the research is pretty clear from Delaware and from Wisconsin on this one at this stage of the game. And you can look at some uh, costs of harvesting here that come into play as well. So again, another crop out there. Uh, some people call that rich man's corn silage. And so that's why I thought I would drop that in in the discussion here today. Um, let's just highlight these very quickly, guys, and then we'll see if we have any questions to be answered at this stage of the game. Corn size results, basically, when you get your sheet back, there's lots of different ways to look at it. Here's a listing of them. Uh, this is a very common one they call the summative equation or the OARDI from Ohio State or the Weiss equation at this point, the in vitro test, and then you'll see some, some of our tests are called Schwab Shaver. If you see that primarily in the Midwest labs, Schwab Shaver 
simply says they have adjusted the value of the corn slide energy based on the 48 hour in vitro NDF digestibility test and there's a moisture adjustment dryer you lower the energy value and they adjust for processing so again you'll see these numbers and here's just an example on the bottom down here here it says TDN it says one times maintenance sometimes you'll show 3x maintenance this is a net energy value here you've got net energy for gain for milk you've got milk per ton per acre you may see a summative equation down here you may also have one based on fiber just on a fiber calculation so some labs don't want to get caught in the middle and say well we don't want to pick one number as being right we'll let our computer spit out six of them and of course as nutritionists as consultants you have to decide which one you're probably going to work off of as far as that goes and I, I like I, I like the Schwab shaver number which would be reflective right here at this stage of the game by the way guys and gals that's an A pluser look, 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 look at the moisture here we're looking at 35 percent dry matter look at my starch 38 percent starch look at my NDF digestibility 60 look at my NDF being very modest at, at 36 boy I just hope I got a bunch of this stuff in Illinois this year to feed my cows as we look at it. So Steve, we're done. Uh, we're going to summarize okay. here and uh, look at the summary points. You can read those at your pleasure and I'll turn the program back over, over to you. Okay, very good Mike. Uh, always a great job and uh, we, uh, we appreciate it very very much. Um, the, uh, it's a good time to remind uh, our participants that this uh, webinar today was brought to us uh, by Biotol, 4-Age Inoculants, uh, a part of the Lelamon Animal Nutrition Group and we thank them for their support and uh, we can uh, see from the slide that uh, next month we're going to be talking about responsible antibiotic use that's going to be brought to us by Mary All, Jeff Smith from North Carolina State is going to be taking the uh, lead on that presentation and you mentioned uh, not long ago Chuck Schwab uh, now a nutri nutrition consultant here in Wisconsin uh, is going to be talking about amino acid, amino acid balancing and uh, uh, protein uh, feeding for protein production that's going to be brought by to us by Elanco. So Mike, uh, you have a question there that you want to take? Yeah, we have a couple of questions here that we can uh, that I see here and uh, Jim you'll keep me honest as well at, the, at, the, at this stage of the game and we certainly welcome you. you have questions now's a good time to send them in. I know some of you have to be off and running so we understand the formal part of this is over and uh, this these will all be archived. Uh, uh, Steve, do you want to mention that at all? The archive? Well, yes. I should mention to the to those of you who are participating today that uh, this webinar and all of the previous ones we've had going back to January uh, are available uh, uh, at no cost on our uh, as on our archives. Just go to horch.com and uh, click on webinars, and uh, we'll be uh, given instructions on how to uh, retrieve uh, past webinars uh, from the archives. The other thing I should mention is that uh, participants will receive a poll regarding this webinar here in the next day or two. It just takes a few seconds to click. Uh, uh, the responses, but the important thing there is if you have comments about webinars, if there are subjects you'd like to see covered on future webinars, that's where we would love to hear from you uh, regarding that. So Mike, um, back to you then. Very good. Well, first of all, Jim Baltz, thank you very much for walking me through this. Uh, as some of you know, I'm not very technologically very skilled at this point. I think we survived this. We had a backup plan and a backup plan, and uh, <laughs> we, we'll move on. Uh, we have a couple of questions here. Wendy asks, really it's a comment, I would say. Uh, Wendy says, uh, if, if corn size is almost $60 a ton and corn price is over $7 a bushel, then how much other forages can I feed to keep the energy uh, high and maintain milk? production as far as that goes. I'm going to answer it two ways. Uh, even though those prices are high, Wendy, uh, they're, they're the real deal. In other words, it's, it's, it's going to be my cheapest source of forage, at least in Illinois at this stage of the game. So basically, I'm going to say if farmer has the inventory, and that's what the beauty of this webinar is, most of my farmers are going to lock in inventory here in the next month. And so that decision, to have this webinar in November probably, probably is not very helpful at this point. We're going to have them lock in as much as we can. I would want to go at least two-thirds. So if a cow eats, uh, the thumb rule is 2% of the cow's body weight as forage dry matter. So if we pick on one uh, Steve's jerseys, because it's a nice round number, a 1,000 pound jersey, and so I'm going to have 20 pounds of dry matter uh, that I'm going to feed to those jersey cows. I'd like to have maybe you know two-thirds of that, which would be like 12 to 14 pounds of that, which would be like 40 
75, 50 pounds of that going in as corn sides. The other third would be coming in from other resources that he may have on the farm, which could include fuzzy cottonseed, although we saw the price on that stuff. That didn't look very attractive right now, although there's a new crop hopefully going to come in this fall and help us out just a little bit. So, Wendy, my answer, getting a little windy here, is simply saying I'd go as high as I can on the corn silage and, and then see what inventories we have because I don't think this hay price is going to help us out. And on the folks down here in Oklahoma, I move in with them, and Texas, they're screaming. I mean, they are burnt up. They are really burnt up. So, I, boy, I tell you, if in doubt, to chop another 10 acres as far as that goes. Another question came in, would any of your recommendations change for those using upright silos for corn silage? Um, I, th I think, uh, uh, Steve, I guess you asked that question, and I assume we're talking about dry matters as far as that goes. Is that right, Steve? Uh, yes, or anything, uh, length of chop or anything, uh, as far as it's, you know, the settling, the packing that takes place in our uprights. You know, about half of our subscribers uh, uh, still have uprights for hay, corn silage and hay silage, and so... Uh, some of their, some of them, and some of their advisors may want to know what might be different there. Yeah, well, basically, Steve, my answer, and you can commits on this one as well. Uh, we know that the upright silos have tremendous compaction, especially the bottom two thirds of the silo. So I think they can be a little more forgiving, in at least the bottom two thirds. Now, strategically, Steve, I would, I would say, I, I think I get awfully good compaction in my upright silos in the bottom two thirds. I might change my my chopping procedure in terms of length of chop. I might shorten it up a little bit, and maybe and make sure I'm really cracking the kernel a little bit tougher when I get to the top of the silo, as far as that goes, because you and I both know I don't have near the hydraulic pressure to get the compaction we have up there at that stage of the game. Also be aware that those big 20, uh, 20 by 80s or whatever we're talking about, tremendous pressure and they'll really start weeping on us. Tremendous mm. leakage sauce losses. And what Minnesota years ago said that you had to be about two units drier for every 10 feet starting about 50 feet. So if your optimal uh, dry matter was say 35, let's just make it 35, you could say it's 34. If I got a 60 footer, I need to be two units drier because of compression. If I go to 70 footer, so you can see the higher these silos get, generally speaking, we have to go a little bit drier, especially towards the base of that silo because of the compaction that's going to occur. What's the bad news? Well, we fill them from the bottom up, you know, so it's backwards. The dry stuff's going to go, the wet stuff's going to go in first from that field, the drier stuff a two or three or four days later on towards the top. So I can't turn that silo upside down very well, but uh, I would be aware of those two things. Basically, uh, good compaction, especially in the bottom about two-thirds of the silo and then be well aware of the moisture because we don't want to lose anytime you got leachate going out that ends up being typically eight to nine or ten percent dry matter and of course it's all my sugars and starches and solubles that's good stuff and I guess if you grow up in Kentucky you can make something else out of that stuff as well which we won't mention with our, with our, our crowd here today as far as that goes anything you want to add to that Steve oh uh, no that's fine I appreciate that and I know we're at the end of our um, official uh, hour and again I want to thank you for a wonderful presentation and uh, also for uh, Biotol uh, uh, Forage Products for their support. I think we have one more question for those that want to stay on. Uh, 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 you're welcome to do that, but just thanks for your uh, uh, presentation, Mike, and for the listeners' uh, presentation or participation. So you bet. we got two quick questions here, and we'll okay. hammer them out very, very quickly. It right. says, uh, "Hi, uh, when you when you say f uh, full maturity, that mine uh, that's that on the card is the corn is hard, hard." And the answer is yes. Yeah. If you go to black layer, I, uh, uh, one, by all means, I didn't. I, I would stand corrected if, if it was interpreted that way. Whoop. Um, we seem to have lost Mike's uh, audio. We were at the end of our presentation in the event that you can hear us uh, here in Fort Atkinson. But again, uh, uh, thanks for being with us today. And uh, for the archives uh, of this uh, webinar and others uh, before, go to Horge.com and click on our webinar uh, links. So thanks for being with us. Uh, so long for today.